Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, just by way of a quick introduction, I know very little about AI, uh, especially when I compare myself with you. So I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I'm a barrister. I also have a PhD in law. I'm engaged with the UCL Center for Law, Economics and Society, and I'm also a lecturer in law uh, and competition, uh, rather competition law at Coventry University. So the idea behind today's presentation was really to share with you a competition lawyer's perspective on algorithms. So hopefully to add a further dimension to your understanding or your appreciation of how algorithms might work and machine learning might impact uh, society and especially uh, economy. So my plan is really to uh, go through this presentation in one go and then to take questions in the end. Uh, if you have any questions whilst I'm speaking, please feel free to pop them in the chat and then I can call upon you and ask you to repeat the question when we are done. Okay, so uh, the title of the talk a little bit differently from the abstract I shared because I revised it when I was uh, uh, preparing for today. It's algorithms in the marketplace and their effects and the treatment. So I think I'd like to invite you to think about what kind of market we would want as consumers, because we might be specialists in our fields, but one thing that we all have in common is that we are consumers of different products in the economy. So what kind of markets are we looking for? Possible scenarios, we can have, uh, sorry, just many firms. Uh, this is known in the language of competition law as a perfect competition. We can have only one firm, and that we refer to as a monopoly. And we can have a few firms, um, which is referred to in competition law terms as an oligopoly. I think you might be able to see immediately that if you have one firm only in a particular sector, let's say, you know, we all need to buy cell phones and there's one company in the world that manufactures and sells cell phones, then that company is going to be very, very powerful. It's going to be able to dictate prices uh, to the consumers, it's going to be able to, uh, you know, sit on innovation and just churn, give us the same old phone year in and year out and we are stuck with it because there's nobody else. And it can also treat its labor very badly or do whatever it likes, basically. So just a lot of power. Um, many firms is obviously ideal in, in, in a perfect world because they will act as a check on each other and uh, drive innovation, drive prices down. Um, but what really happens where we really end up standing in, in the real world is where we have a few firms dominating a particular sector. And this is where a lot of competition law analysis is focused. And hopefully a lot of it will become clear as we go on. Right. So what are the kind of things that affect competition? So, you know, we've said we'd ideally like to have perfect competition, but what are the things that can block it? So for the purposes of this presentation, I'm focusing on EU competition law, which was introduced by the Treaty of Functioning of Europe. Um, but I'd have to say that almost every country in the world today has a competition law, whether it's a developing country or a developed country. And, and therefore, what, and, and a lot of those competition laws are also based and modeled after the EU uh, competition laws. So a lot of what I'm saying today is actually relevant to uh, many, many countries, and particularly also to the UK, because the UK follows, a, well, was part of the EU, follows the EU in its major um, competition decisions by law. So the Competition Act, uh, uh, the UK Competition Act actually says that the law, that the decisions will follow those of the EU. So what are the kind of things that EU law says are harmful to competition? First of all, companies might band together. They might enter into an anti, what we refer to as anti-competitive agreements. So they might agree with each other to charge the same price uh, for their products. You know, I'll sell mine for 10 pounds and you sell yours for 10 pounds. We basically rake in the profit and um, 
and actually steal from the consumers in a sense. They can share, they can decide to allocate different, uh, look, different jurisdictions, different distribution uh, areas for themselves. They can decide to limit output. So they can agree to do many, many different things. Uh, which can be very detrimental to competition because they're ultimately harmful to the consumers in, in the sense that the consumers are deprived of choice and they also have to pay a higher price. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of cartels and cartels are actually a form of anti-competitive agreements where companies which are operating at the same level of the market come together to, um, uh, to charge a certain price or to share um, uh, territories with each other. Another uh, competition, um, anti-competitive practice, uh, competition violation is abuse of dominance. So sometimes a firm is not quite a monopoly, but it's large enough that it can actually leverage its, its dominance. When I say large, I don't mean physically, I mean it has market power and it, it can leverage that market power uh, in engaging practices that bring in, bring benefit to it, but at the expense of the consumer. Sometimes in an oligopolistic uh, structure, different companies can come together and, um, and exercise dominance uh, in the market as well. Um, mergers is another area that competition law looks at and mergers can lead to uh, dominance in the market. So mergers can um, lead to dominance and therefore eliminate competition. So these are the kind of things that competition law looks at. Um, I've already talked about this, but this gives you an idea. So the core market abuses is when two people or two companies rather form an agreement to, uh, to charge higher prices in this uh, clip here, or like I said, other, um, other market abuses as well. And this is a clip that actually just talks, sort of tries to depict uh, the abuse of dominant position, which is the, basically the big fish eating the small fish. So it's not quite a monopoly, but it's just um, within a market, there is somebody who is very powerful and can use that power against um, other players in the market. So you might be wondering, and very rightly so, how do algorithms affect competition? So, so why do we, I mean, so far it doesn't seem to have anything to do with algorithms, but increasingly algorithms are playing a big role in the economy and there are particular ways in, the, in which they affect competition. And that's what I will be talking about now. So first of all, computers can collude. So if you remember, we've said that it's anti-competitive for firms and companies and under manufacturing concerns to form in anti-competitive agreements. Now, what algorithms can do is that they can facilitate um, such agreements even without parties having, going, having to go through the difficulty of meeting with each other and, and, and deciding what they're planning to do. Of course, that's also an option. So computers and artificial intelligence can facilitate collusion either uh, by intention. So the parties may have an, in, have an, an intention to coordinate uh, with each other or sometimes simply by creating a predictable and controllable environment, which, does, which is not uh, susceptible to the deterrent effects generated through antitrust enforcement. So whatever competition law restricts um, can actually be aggravated by algorithms. So algorithms can basically, algorithms in the marketplace can basically exaggerate the effects or the anti-competitive effects that competition law is trying to um, um, sanction. So for the purposes of competition law, and this actually might be terminology that you're quite familiar with, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but there are four types of um, algorithms that we've identified. There's the messenger, which is when consumers execute the will of humans in their quest to collude and restrict competition. So here it's very much the humans or the, and the manufacturing concerns which want to collude and they're using the algorithms to um, achieve that collusion. So that's when the algorithm is simply a messenger for um, the manufacturing concerns. It can be a hub and spoke which means that different undertakings actually end up using a single algorithm to determine the uh, market price charged by numerous users. So that's another form of collusion uh, that can take place. 
Um, in predictable agent, humans unilaterally design the machine to deliver predictable outcomes in a given way to changing market conditions, but they're aware that there are uh, other developments in the market and how they might be able to coordinate with each other. And finally, we have what we refer to as the autonomous machine. And this is a situation in which competitors unilaterally create and use computers to achieve a given target. And it's actually the machines that through self-learning independently determine um, collusive outcomes. So that's where it gets really tricky uh, when it's the machine is learning from itself. Um, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. Perhaps we can take this up in the questions if you have any on this issue. So the idea behind this is to show you that collusion can be, there's a range in which algorithms can affect collusion. So it can be, it can start from where the collusion is directly controlled by the undertaking behind the algorithm and go all the way to a collusion which is independent of the undertaking behind the algorithm. So if you can imagine that range, I think reality falls in various places between uh, the two extremes, but can also exist at the extremes. Um, algorithms can also bolster a dominant position. So in addition to uh, facilitating anti-competitive agreements, algorithms can also bolster a dominant position. And this is becoming especially important when we have, uh, when we see multi-sided platforms, um, these platforms use algorithms in interacting with their customers, promotion of their services or demotion of competitors' services. And although these platforms are free to use, they require users to provide a range of personal data. And the more data that a platform can collect gives it greater um, power and greater, uh, it, beca it is more attractive to other consumers. So that's what we refer to as a network effect. So the more data it collects, the more powerful it becomes and therefore the more data that uh, it is able to collect. Um, so it has an extraordinary advantage uh, that data um, and algorithms give to a dominant firm that is operating in the digital arena. A very important case uh, from the competition law perspective was the Google search case, which was decided in uh, 2017. And basically the gist of that case is um, in that little phrase over there, data is the new money. And Google search was using algorithms and vast amount of data to, to command a great deal of market power. And what it was doing was uh, using its market power in the general search services to um, become more powerful in the adjacent market for comparison shopping services. And when it appeared before the commission and the commission said, you're abusing your dominant position, Google basically said, I'm not charging consumers anything. So what's, how can it be an abuse? My, you know, there's no price increase um, for my consumer. And here the EU in quite a breakthrough said that even zero price products can be evidence of abuse. So zero price products, I mean, the fact that the search is free of cost to consumers, but the, it is being monetized through the data they're providing every time they use the search engine. And therefore um, that can be taken into account in determining both the market size, the dominance and the abuse. So you can see that algorithms are changing the shape of competition law. For the purposes of our discussion today, I'm going to focus more on collusion. Recent competition literature suggests that authorities should be able to distinguish between situations where undertakings adopt algorithms to generate or stabilize collusion and algorithms that work independently but create tacit collusion and algorithms that facilitate collusion. So going back to the messenger, hub and spoke, predictable agent and autonomous learning uh, algorithms, the idea is that they can't all be beaten by the same stick, that there has to be some a nuanced analysis of these different types of algorithms and the kind of collusion they enter into. Um, Competition and other literature also recognizes that there's a threefold challenge of taking action against algorithms. How do you detect them? How do you decide they're illegal? And who do you hold accountable for these problems? So let's look at the threefold challenge, okay? 
The first challenge, detection. So we understand that price fixing through algorithms may replace more classic forms of collusion where, you know, the smoke filled cigar room that we all imagine in, I don't know, old films, very old films, new films perhaps as well. Can't remember any names right now. Uh, but now it, that, that has been replaced by computer screens, you know, very efficient um, levels of, and of coordination through algorithms. Just as it makes collusion easier, it makes detection by competition authorities much more um, difficult. And it is even more important that the action that authorities take is not heavy handed, that it takes into consideration the human and fundamental rights protection for corporate defendants. Um, other, advantage, uh, other, other advances in communication, such as emails or digitalization, which facilitate record keeping, may assist competition authorities in detection of collusive practices. So the actual collusion may be taking place through the algorithms. Um, but around that, there's another digital sort of penumbra or a world or you know, a layer around it, which actually protects uh, this kind of uh, collusion from further detection. Challenge two. How do you decide when they're guilty? Um, or guilty, of course, is a, is a sort of classic law word, but how do you decide that algorithms are bad? So they're considered coordination facilitators when their use constitutes an intended and avoidable act that facilitates coordination by creating conscious commitments to a common scheme, which is not justified on pro-competitive grounds. So this is an actual quote from the case um, that the competition uh, authorities decided. But I think it's a, the authorities are also recognizing, as I've said before, that you can't hold all kind of algorithms to be illegal. You have to see, are they, uh, is the facilitation because of the algorithm itself, or is it because certain conditions have arisen in the digital world that have created this. So you can't attribute it to the algorithm, but perhaps to the other developments around it. Um, what kind of coordination is the algorithm producing? Is it algorithms, are they facilitating coordination among competitors, which is what competition law sanctions? Or is it simply making it a more efficient economy by cre creating coordination among other marketeers, which is not a problem for competition law. But again, these things have to be very carefully sorted out. Perhaps the most important thing when thinking about illegality is that you cannot cast the net of illegality too widely because it can have a dampening effect on innovation. And that's always a sort of a line that competition law has always straddled. You know, where do you, where do you draw the line? Where, when do you become so restrictive that you actually impede innovation. And that's, that's a question that becomes even more important in the, in the world in which we are using many more algorithms. And the final challenge is, of course, the challenge of accountability. Who is liable? Is it the designer who designs the algorithm? Is it the company who, that uses the algorithm? Who are you going to make liable? Because at three stages, there's a designer, there's a company, there's an affectee. Um, and this problem becomes very, uh, uh, you know, it, it becomes much more aggravated when you have machine learning algorithms. So even perhaps the designer and the company that uses them, maybe the designer knows, but certainly the company that's using them may not even be fully aware of the ways in which the algorithm may evolve in the future. So how, how do you, who do you hold accountable for an algorithm like that? And these are the three great challenges that all competition authorities are going to face when they're thinking about um, taking action against algorithmic collusion. So let's talk a little bit about taking action against uh, algorithms. Um, so as I said, even if the three challenges of taking action against algorithms may be resolved, the enforcement powers of most competition authorities do not at present extend to autonomous self-communicating algorithms which may simply be converging with each other. So why is that? So competition authorities, especially when it comes to collusion, require intent. So you, you, there must be an intention to collude for there to be collusion, okay? And it can be expressed or it can be tacit, but there has to be the, the intent, the aim of collusion has to be in mind as it were. But when it comes to algorithms, how do you attribute intention? And that's a big debate. That's a separate debate. I've been reading up on that as well. And 
frankly, from a lawyer's perspective, much more interesting uh, also. But today, the point is just to let you know that that is a big concern. How do you find intention? How do you decide how, who to make responsible for a self-learning algorithm? So then from a lawyer's perspective, you have three options, or from a law enforcer's perspective, I should say, you have three options. You can just say, business as usual, you know, the present law is sufficient to, to look at these situations and we're just going to stick with the present law. Uh, and of course, the huge num amount of caveats to that. Uh, I personally don't think the present law is, um, I think the idea of intention and where to draw the line, for instance, is a big difficulty in the present law. What two other options? The first one is ex ante regulation, which means that you supervise and examine algorithms before they're launched and you examine them for the tendency to collude. What does that mean? How will it be done? Those are questions to be considered. And then the third option is ex post regulation. And there the idea is that you look at the effect of the algorithm and you see how it's actually um, uh, interacting with the world. Uh, again, the standards that we're going to use, the legal principles we're going to use are uh, you know, still being uh, sorted out. So it's not terribly clear, but basically you have three different ways in which you can engage with algorithms. Um, one idea that is very popular, and this was um, represented by Joe Harrington, who suggests that the properties of algorithms should be observed in a simulated market. And this simulation would have to be carried out by competition authorities or a specialized agency. Now, the problem with this otherwise very interesting idea is that there may be there are too many different algorithms which are in being in use constantly or being modified, and it's very difficult to simulate the effects of all of them. And the other thing is that, of course, such a thing would be extremely costly. And, um, you know, if you're going to carry it out meaningfully, it would have to be carried out regularly and for all types of algorithms, and that would just really send the the cost of um, um, algorithmic investigation to the skies. It would be absolutely impossible to, to make it viable. So another idea uh, that is going around and is gaining quite a bit of currency is to develop the good algorithm. And I have you know, C3PO and R2D2 as the idea of the good robot. So just like we had the good robot, to think about what is a good algorithm. So the very famous uh, novel by Isaac Asimov um, talks about this three laws of robotics. And basically he says that a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings except for such orders would conflict with the first law, which is that they harm a human being. Or a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the two laws that, sorry, with the two laws that I mentioned earlier. So that, so Ulrich Schwabe suggests that, you know, we consider something like Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics for algorithms as well. And basically in, in the language of law, what we're saying is that we think of constraints at a fundamental level. So at basic constraints, ethical constraints that are fed into the design, um, uh, of the algorithm and no other kind of algorithm might be accepted. Um, again, the issue of very sophisticated algorithm remains uh, in place and it's, um, it's, it's not clear how these laws would overcome the sophisticated algorithm which can actually override uh, previous restrictions. Satya Nadella has also uh, created some rules for AI, and I'm just going to headline them. So it says, like Isaac Asimov, AI must be designed to assist humanity. AI must be transparent. That sort of really feeds into the explainable AI uh, discussion, and I think it's, it's a really critical discussion to be had. Um, AI must maximize efficiencies without destroying the dignity of people. AI must be designed for intelligent privacy. AI must have algorithmic accountability, and that feeds into the big challenge that I've been talking about. 
and AI must guard against bias. So really quite an impressive wish list and, and I should say impressive and perhaps ambitious because uh, as we all know that you know algorithms are constantly accused of uh, being biased as well. So, so it remains to be seen how that would work out. But at least it's a starting point for discussion on these issues. So what does this mean for competition-related AI, since that's what we've been talking about so far? The challenge for developing guidelines for regulating competition-related AI is to strike the appropriate balance between enabling competition and, sorry, protecting competition and enabling innovation. So that's where the thinking lies. And to this end, the regulations would set out how AI can be used in specific economic sectors and require that AI be transparent explainable and ethical. So one of the phrases that is being uh, sort of talked about uh, the most is that trustworthy AI might offer a solution. So what is trustworthy AI? Um, again, let's have a look. So trustworthy AI, for, or rather for AI to be trustworthy, it needs to be ethical, legal, and robust. So basically that means it should set down standards for transparency, accountability, privacy, and non-discrimination. And it must meet uh, these standards at all times. So very much in keeping with the laws of robotics and Satya Nadella's laws for, um, for AI. So what do we do? Do we make trust, uh, trustworthiness mandatory? And if you do, to the extent that country makes requirements of trustworthy AI mandatory, it can prevent a company from selling an AI product in that jurisdiction if it fails to meet these requirements. Now, again, a question that immediately comes to mind, and I will take it up later as well, is that will a country risk doing that in, a, in, a, in, in the present economy? Because what would it mean in terms of losing our business? So a thought to be borne in mind that is mandatory an option. Another is making these guidelines voluntary. So what you're really relying on when you are making it voluntary is the, is the response of the consumers and other stakeholders. So basically saying that if it's not ethical, then it, people will reject it. Um, and I, argue, I want to know how much will people understand it as well for, to, uh, to reject or accept it. Um, but that is one way of looking at it, that you keep it voluntary and just expect that people will not want to invest in or use a technology which cannot be trusted. So relying on the good sense of the stakeholder. And it has worked. And I think some of the more humane objectives of um, society. So for instance, we've seen that people have are, are, are rejecting products that are not ethically sourced or not environmentally friendly. So I think it's that kind of thinking that we're bringing to, uh, to the fore for AI as well. Um, so what is the trustworthiness agenda? The adoption of regulation to ensure, ensure trustworthy AI through very, it, various regulatory modalities figures prominently on government's agenda as one of the most direct tools to shape AI stakeholders' behavior. So what I want to focus on, or what I'd like you to think about, is that it's they're thinking about various regulatory modalities, which, which suggests that there's no one right answer and there's no one right way of achieve, approaching algorithms. And because they're so complex that they have, you have to have different a sort of a range of tools in the box to address them. So competition authorities of countries adopting such guidelines can adapt these for use in algorithms used for competition purposes. It is important, however, to see, and I think this is the critical point, it is really important to see who leads the process. That country will shape the world AI future. And, and we, can, we can see that the, I'll wait for the next slide, hang on. So EU has already um, done some work on um, developing guidelines for trustworthy AI. So in April 2019, an independent high-level expert group on artificial intelligence set up by the EC published ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. And there's a lot more detail, but I decided not to go into it in this presentation. But the guidelines provide a framework for trustworthy AI, which cover foundations of trustworthy AI, um, the strategy for realizing trustworthy AI, 
and assessing trustworthy AI. So notice again that these are only guidelines. So in terms of um, law, these are not binding. They're, they're meant to um, um, be a code of conduct as it were. Um, and also I think to give a sense to people how the authorities would respond to issues with algorithms. Other countries and organizations that are in the process of uh, thinking about standards are Canada, the US, Japan, you have China, um, I have EU again, but you know several other countries, OECD, UNESCO, they're also there. And I think there's really, what is really, really important is that we move towards a global response. Because given the scale of operations of companies that usually engage AI, think of Google, it is very likely, in fact, it is possibly inevitable that the AI in question has an international rather than a localized impact. And it's therefore necessary to develop a unified global response to the need for trustworthy AI. Fail this is a very important point that I'm making um, here, that failure to develop a unified response may lead to regulatory arbitrage, which companies domiciling themselves in countries that have weaker regulation. And, um, you know, that would be detrimental to not only the country that has actually uh, let go of the economic advantage of having these companies domiciled, but also lead to a global um, problem because these companies would be free to uh, conduct their business in ways that are that are really to their advantage because they're you know will will the laws of of other co countries apply to them? So this is a big legal conundrum which will have to be, and that is why it's so important that there is unified response. Um, I think I also want to say that um, whichever country takes the lead on this will actually be able to almost um, have its regulations replicated, especially in the developing world, which doesn't have the capacity to, um, to have uh, an independent response. So that is the advantage of somebody, a strong, powerful country or, or EU taking the lead and really thinking it through and understanding what is needed. So it is also important that developing trustworthy AI shouldn't be about ticking boxes, but should be about continuously identifying and implementing requirements, evaluating solutions, ensuring improved outcomes through the AI system's life cycle, and involving stakeholders to ensure that the dynamism of AI is not lost. And I think this is where the bridge that we are trying to create through this conversation as well is really, really critical, that there has to be some conversation between those who understand AI and how it operates um, and, and machine learning are able to talk to lawyers and talk to economists, talk to law enforcers and really arrive at a solution which is intelligent, which understands the, the nature of the beast as it were that it's working with rather than just clamping it down and dampening uh, further development in this area. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I hope I didn't talk for too long, just about 30 minutes. And I am now happy to take questions if you have any.